Good morning. Welcome to Forge. Uh, we uh, are a place where God is building men and strength and truth. Uh, we're a place where uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, God wants to continue to build great men as he defines greatness. So I'm glad you're here. And uh, by the way, just as a follow-up, uh, we I want you guys to note that... Um, uh, in, in this series, 21st Century Discipleship, we are bringing some extra speakers in so you guys can uh, reach out and bring some other uh, friends to them. Uh, Dave Manuel is my neighbor. He's the chief of police of uh, Maitland. And uh, yesterday when I was jogging, I was jogging down the street and uh, there he was doing um, sprints in front of his house. And uh, he lives in the same development that I live in. He's a member of, he goes uh, to Action Church, and uh, he's a man's man. He also, uh, I, when I was in his office talking to him, I, I, I saw a picture on the wall, and I go, I know that other guy over there. Who is that? He goes, that was Reggie Kidd when he was a lot younger. Uh, years and years ago, Dave Manuel saved Reggie Kidd's son uh, in a pool accident, a drowning and so the kids have been friends. If you know uh, Reggie Kidd, he's the, uh, um, the dean of the cathedral downtown, St. Luke's. And St. Luke's, yeah, right? Yeah. Episcopal, yes, thank you. Got that right. And uh, so Dave Manuel's a man's man, 82nd Airborne, and been a police officer, and uh, then chief of police. He's a great guy. You'll enjoy him. I think John Rivers, who can beat his testimony. We are going to have Forge here. You'll get a special message from, from me here, and then if you want to be super spiritual and do Thursday as well that day, uh, you can go over and hear John Rivers. But I, I tried to get him for here, guys, but John doesn't ask me uh, about his schedule. He tells me, so there it is. I can only get him one place. All right, today we're in a series, 21st Century Discipleship. We're continuing that series, and we're talking uh, about uh, today, uh, disciple making disciples by just being normal. Let me tell you about a story by the, uh, of a guy by the name of Jim Plunkett. How many of you heard of that name, Jim Plunkett? Good, a lot of you have. And, and football season's coming up. It's going to be a, a great time. I enjoy football season. Of course, Dan Lasich is going to be impossible to live with as we deal with the Steelers and all that. But Jim Plunkett was a former Super Bowl MVP. Uh, uh, he was uh, in the news recently as he was telling one of the latest NFL players to talk about his crippling illnesses. Uh, and uh, as a result of his NFL career, it seems like that's... Uh, what's happening a lot lately. This is what Jim Plunkett said. He said, my life sucks. How about that? What, um, what do you really think about your life? It's no fun being in this body right now. Everything hurts. He's 69 years of age, uh, uh, two Super Bowl champs with the Oakland Raiders. He was a Heisman Trophy winner in 1970. A lot of you weren't even around in 1970. Uh, after a storied career with Stanford University, winning the Heisman Trophy, he was a great player. I, I loved watching him. He's had 18 operations, two artificial knees, an artificial shoulder. He's had has debilitating pain in his surgically repaired back. Uh, 15 seasons in the NFL, probably 10 concussions. And, and that's Jim Plunkett's story right now. And it's not a pretty story. But it is his story, right? It is, it is what it is. And it is who he is right now. Our, a man's story is who we are, what we've done, how we've lived, and what's going on in our life, and what's happening as a result of what's gone on in our life. In this series, in 21st Century Discipleship, in the t first talk, we talked about Matthew 28, 18 through uh, 20. What is a disciple? And in that talk, we, we said, well, really, a disciple is somebody whose story has come to the point where they've come to the end of themselves and come to see they need a Savior. A disciple of Jesus Christ is somebody who puts their faith in Christ, not as a historical figure, but as the Son of God and Savior of sinners. A man's come to the end of himself, says, I can't get right with God, and I need to get right with God through faith in Christ. Uh, and so a disciple is a justified man declared not guilty because of Christ's work. He's also an adopted son. Uh, and so we talked about that in talk one. In talk two, Dan Lasich talked about discipling 
our wives. How many were a little bit shocked about that terminology that we are to disciple our wives? Well, I mean, some yes, some no. Uh, and, and, and I think in one of the printings, Dan, it got translated disciplining our wives. <laughs> Now, that's an absolute impossibility, right? And we're not, we don't want to talk about that. But discipling our wives is a part uh, of what uh, we as husbands do as disciples. Uh, but that takes a lot of care to do that. And today in talk four, we're going to talk about disciples making disciples by just being normal. Because disciples don't just follow Jesus. They make other disciples. That's what we do. Disciples are followers, but we make other disciples. But one of the problems with this whole idea of making disciples, I think we've made it so much more complicated than it's supposed to be. And so as a result, a lot of men following Christ say, I'm a disciple, but it's going to be very cold in a hot place before I make another disciple. You know how hard evangelism is? Do you know how hard it is to enter into somebody else's life? We make it more complicated than we need, to, we need to be, and so we're going to talk about that today. Now, in talk three, last week, John Thurman was here, uh, and he talked about his ministry. John's a vice president at uh, Insurance Offices of America, if you remember, but he has a ministry. Does anybody remember the name of the ministry? He calls it the Ministry of availability. You were listening. That's good. John, he has this ministry of availability that he does with businessmen, and, it's, and, and he said a lot of good things. He said uh, his goal is trying to get guys from here to there, because disciples grow, right? They ought to grow. And so he makes himself available. People call him up. I think five of you guys called him up and said, I want to get together. And so he looked at me on Thursday and he said, I've got five appointments from Tuesday. I go, great, you need something to do. You don't work hard enough. If you love Jesus, you'd work harder. Um, but, uh, but, but he said a lot of things. He said things like this. He said, most men are running away from what they fear rather than running to what they're passionate about. That was important. It's a part of a lot of our stories. He said, what causes men the greatest pain is acting out of their, do you remember what he said? Shame. Shame. He said, what causes us a lot of pain is that we live out of our shame. By the way, I've got a book up here. I've read it. I got a couple of notes in it, but my name has been crossed out. And if you want to take this book on shame, you come up and take it and read it and pass it on to somebody else or keep it. It's a great book. We need to deal with our shame and where our shame comes from. Uh, so because of our shame, John said, we live out of our false self rather than our true self. Uh, and so we're living a lie. We're wearing a mask. And he said, our early life programming uh, often leads us to live in a way that uh, it's part of our story. We just live out of our early life programming. We don't even think about what we do. And he said, what we need to do if we want to make an impact as disciples is to be authentic, to be honest and authentic with other people. And he says, we need to invite them into our, what do he say? Invite them into our story. And when we invite people into our story, what it does is it makes a deeper connection with people quickly. And, and, then, and then we can tell them about Jesus because Jesus is a part of our story. Uh, and, uh, and, and yet the problem is, is getting authentic and telling our story. Because what we as men love to do is we love to cover up, and you, we've said it here a million times, when you see a guy on Sunday morning, he says, how are you doing? What do we typically say? Doing great. I'm fine. I'm doing good. How are you? And I'm the master of this. I want you to know I've mastered this as a senior pastor. How are you doing? Great. How are you? And then, because people always like to talk about themselves. Uh, and, and so it's so, you know, they do, and so it's easy. And then I don't have to talk about myself. Uh, but the, the reality is, is that um, being authentic and telling our story to people can be a very difficult thing. Here's what I've learned. I've learned that once I understand the grace of God in a deeper way in Christ, and I understand that Jesus paid the price for me on the cross, and he's not angry at me, and that I am God's beloved son, in whom he is well pleased. What do we say our core identity is around here? 
Our core identity is deeply beloved, redeemed sons of the Most High God. The more I get that, the more I don't have to play a game with you and I can be authentic and I can tell you where I mess up. I can tell you my story. And, and that invites other people into our story, my story. I, I had dinner with a friend and his wife the other day. And he, they came over to our house. We go back a long way. He's a pastor's son, a PK, pastor's kid. And uh, he's older now. Uh, but his, his brand of... His brand of Christianity that he grew up in was performance Christianity. You know what I mean by that, guys? You know, you're, you know it's Jesus and. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So he, we were talking around the table. I, so what's new? We, hadn't, we were catching up, and he goes, you know, Pete, because we've been talking about grace for a very long time. He looked at me, and he said, the other, and he's in his 50s. He said, the other day, as I was spending time with the Lord, I felt for the very first time that God, my Father, hugged me. And he felt at a deep level the approval of God the Father. He knows the gospel. He knows God. But because of the performance orientation in his family, he transferred to God this earthly father experience of performance orientation. He said, for the very first time, I began to experience that God hugged me. And guys, when we get that grace, it helps us to be more vulnerable and open up to others and tell them our story. And as we tell them our story, we tell them about Jesus. And, and you say, this is weird. <laughs> no, it isn't. The Apostle Paul did this. And I want to give you an illustration of how he did this in, in, in the time that we have before your table talk today. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to understand that this, this whole thing, you want to connect with other people, you want to be more authentic, you want to be a disciple that makes disciples in a way that's just normal, here it is. The Apostle Paul does it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. I'm going to read it real quick and unpack it real quick, and then you get to talk about it around your table. So Paul says, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Philippians 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And I love it. You know, when Paul often says finally in his letters, does it mean that he's almost done? The answer is no. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when I look at my watch, when people are in, in a sermon and they're looking at their watch, you know what I want to say to them? Hey, some of you are looking at your watch. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. We're not done yet. <laughs> so here we go. Finally, my brethren, doesn't mean finally. He's got a whole two chapters to go. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and here's important, put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisees, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found what, guys? Blameless. But, here's the contrast, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. Count them, but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of, of that which I was laid hold of by Christ. Guys, guys, the, 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 the subject of this text is the righteousness of Christ, or righteousness. And the theme is, what kind of righteousness should we pursue? 
But do you notice? Do you notice Paul's points? He, he knew his story. He told his story. And Jesus was the hero of his story. Do you see that? Let, let me unpack that real quick. And then you can talk about it around your table. First of all, he knew his story. He knew his story. Um, after telling them to beware of the dogs, I love that phrase. Uh, Paul says, uh, and, he, and he said, to write the same things again is no trouble to me and it's a safeguard. He probably said this to them when he was with them. He started the church in Philippi. So he had probably told them this stuff before, but then he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Because there were people in the church in Philippi who were teaching hear me now, a bastardized form of Christianity. And, and this bastardized form of, of Christianity was Jesus and. They were Judaizers. They were Jews that said, yeah, we have faith in Christ. We believe in Christ. We believe in Christ and the sacrifices of the Old Testament. We believe in Christ and, 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 and the law. You got to fulfill the law. We, we believe in Jesus and circumcision. So they were, you see, whenever you teach a gospel of Jesus and, you're not teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a Presbyterian. I've told you to confess that. If I'm trying to convince you to be a Presbyterian, it's Jesus and. Some of you have a denomination uh, where baptism is super important. Baptism is important to all of us. It should be. If it's Jesus and your particular form of baptism, it's not Christianity. So, so we got a problem with that, and that's what was, was going on. Uh, and, and, so, and so Paul says, listen, they're the false circum. They're, they're trying to focus on Jewish circumcision, Jesus and circumcision. You know, you got to have that because then you're, then you're really right with God. And he's, Paul says, no, we're the true circumcision. We are truly clean with God because of faith in Christ, not because of this action in the body. Uh, we're the true circumcision. We worship in the spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. That's a Christian. But then Paul gets honest and he starts telling his story. I love that. He says, we put no confidence in the flesh. And then he says in verse 4, he goes, ah, although, although I might have the tendency to put confidence in the flesh. And he lists, he tells his story. He says, he says I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel. He's saying, I'm a full-blooded Jew. <laughs> I'm in the covenant people of God. He says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. What's the big deal about being of the tribe of Benjamin? Do you remember historically? Uh, well, we won't go into it, but here's the reason he brings the tribe of Benjamin. When Solomon's son, David's son was Solomon, Solomon's son who followed him was Rehoboam. When Rehoboam took over for Solomon, there was a civil war. And how many tribes stayed true to the Davidic line? Two, Judah and Benjamin. Paul said, listen, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm one of the tribes that say true to the Davidic line. That's what kind of a Jew I am. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Culturally, he says, I'm a Hebrew. Now, he was born in Syrian Antioch, or in, excuse me, Tarsus. He was born in Tarsus in Asia Minor. In, but he says, I'm a good Jew. I'm thoroughly Jewish in every way. I'm steeped in rabbinic teaching. Paul was probably trilingual. Aramaic, Greek, Latin. But he got his theological training in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. So he, was, he, was, he had a PhD in theology under Gamaliel, the equivalent. He says, as a law, I'm a Pharisee. They were the strictest, most uptight Jews you could find. He, Paul was wound tighter than a piano string. He put the L in legalism. Um, I mean, he was, he was a Shiite Jew, I want you to know. As to the zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. Conclusion, as to that which is found in the law, what was he? Blameless. He derived in every way. Uh, as my uh, professor, D.A. Carson, puts it, he was utterly exemplary. That's his story. But then he met Jesus, and that messed the whole thing up. Literally, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, Acts 9. We don't have time to go into that. But uh, oftentimes, our story is that when we, we live one way and then we meet Jesus, and it's a crossroads, right? He messes up our life completely. Uh, 
uh, he changes it completely. <laughs> and, and that's what, and so Paul, after meeting Jesus, what does he say? Now, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as a loss. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul knew his story, gentlemen. And I, I want you to understand that Paul, as a man, had more self-awareness about him than a lot of us have about ourselves. He understood his cultural roots. He understood his thinking patterns. He understood his psychology. He understood his family environment and how it shaped him. Do you catch that? That's his story. And then Jesus entered into his story and changed his story. Your story is your life. It's what's happened to you in your life and how what's happened to you in your life has shaped you. He had this kind of self-awareness. Remember in the Dangerous Freedom seminar, I talk about the myth of male simplicity. Remember when we talked about that? What's, what was my point in that? My, my point was that we think, as men, we think women are complex and we are, we're simple. I mean, all I need is food and some other things, but not many, and I'm fine. Uh, I, I am a simple, simple guy. And I said, no, you're not. That we're all relatively complex. And so I say, it's a myth where you were raised, your cultural background, your ethnicity, all that. Paul knew that he was not a simple guy. And so this text teaches us, first of all, that he knew his story. And then secondly, and these last two points are really quick because we've already basically explained the text. He knew his story and he told his story. He told it right here. He told it to the Philippians. Uh, um, we, we just um, finished our Forge Communicator class been going on for four weeks. Pat Leupold spoke uh, Sunday. Creston Lyford spoke Sunday. Derek Fritsch spoke Sunday. It was awesome to hear these guys unpack a text of Scripture and learn to communicate to men. It was so cool. Guys, good job. Creston really loved being in front of people. Uh, Pat, you had a lot more experience as a former uh, teacher and uh, principal. Uh, so you've been in front of people a little bit more. Creston, this was like your first time. Creston lost his salvation just before he gave it and gained it again somewhere in the midst of it. Uh, it was awesome. But you know what was powerful? As these guys unpacked the scriptures, then they at some point told their personal story to some extent. And you know what happened as they unfolded the text and then they told their story. What happened when they started telling some aspects of their own life? Like when you were telling about that time, I don't want to unpack the whole thing, but you and Karen had a little tiff, and you were right. I love that. But you didn't play that up big, and you went and you apologized to her and got it right. When you told that story, what do you think we were all doing, guys? We were leaning in. We were listening. Because it made it real. It wasn't just intellectual truth. It was how the gospel had been working in Creston. Powerful. So Paul knew his story. He told his story. And then thirdly, uh, he made Jesus the hero of his story. <laughs> I love this because Jesus is the center of the story. When your life is changed by Jesus, he's the hero. He's the center. And then he gets, gets to verse 12 and he goes, uh, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. I love that. He said, Jesus changed my life, but I haven't become perfect yet. And so, and so he, he's moved away significantly because he, he had those other things. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, da, da, da. He had the whole list of what would have made him perfect. And now he says, hey, but I'm not there yet. And so he's authentic. He's opening up his life to other guys. Uh, I'm not righteous in myself. Here's the challenge that I have for us as men as we think of this third or this fourth talk in 21st century discipleship. Um, Paul models to us here in Philippians how to tell our story. 
We got to know our story. We got to tell our story. We got to let Jesus be the hero of the story. This is a model for us. If we want to be disciples who make disciples, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to spread, it's not a complicated thing. It's normal. It's the normal way of life. It's people telling their story to other people. And so here's a model here. And notice that telling your story about Jesus, what Jesus has done in your life, is often very reactive. It's, it's interesting in 1 Peter 3.15. I've always found this fascinating. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord, uh, the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. I've always been interested by that verse. Because what that verse says is, is that's a reactive kind of evangelism, isn't it? It's not go in there and try to win an argument. It's, it's as people come to you and they say, tell me your story. Why are you following Jesus? Because Jesus is just this rabbi who lived a whole bunch of years ago. You make a defense. It's, it's, it's you get a chance to tell your story. Isn't that interesting? That that what this almost presupposes is that the way evangelism is done, the way disciple making is done, is that we are, we are people who live a particularly distinctive life and we move into life in a particular way and at some point people say, tell me your story. But what I have found is this, that usually people don't want to know my story until I have first done what? Ask them their story. And so my, my second challenge from this text for us as men following Christ at the beginning of the 21st century is, is to not only understand how Paul model, models telling your story, but to challenge all of us to be men who are trying to hear the story of other people. See, John... John Thurman's ministry is the ministry of availability, right? Somebody calls him up and says, hey, John, I'd like to get together because I want to get from here to there. Can you help me get from here to there? John says, let's meet. Let's talk. But what is, he, what is, what is the first thing he does when he starts talking to people? You can't move somebody from here to there, from one point in life to another point in life, until you know their, you know their story. When I do marriage counseling, I sit down and I go, well, tell me. Yeah, I don't start, with, I start with what's happening right now, but then I go, okay, let's back up a little bit. Tell me about your families. I want to hear what led up to this. And so, and so the vision that, that I think this gives us is that 21st century disciples, yeah, disciples make disciples, but wouldn't it be awesome if Orlando was filled with Christian men who were interested in hearing the stories of other people? That we weren't so busy that we could make lunch appointments with people, or breakfast appointments with people, where we could say, hey, tell me about your life. Where are you from? What do you do? What do you like to do when you're not working? That, we, that we're men because, because the, great, the gospel of grace has hit us. And we know we're accepted and we're loved. We have time and room in our hearts for other people. And so we're just, we're just simply, tell me your story. Where are you from? Tom, where are you from? You're from Ohio. Really? We listen to people's stories. Tell me about your family. What was your dad like? What did he do? And you know what happens? And the amazing thing is as we, as we listen to other people's stories, because we're so often busy, but as we listen and we're genuinely interested, they might, they might do what? They might say, what's your story? Or they might give you an opportunity to tell your story. And so the gospel helps us with grace to know who we are and what we've become and how Jesus has changed it. And then we have the opportunity of talking to other people. We are not here to win arguments. We are here to make disciples. And Paul models that the most natural way for normal people is to enter relationally into somebody else's life, hear their story, and tell ours. Talk about it around the table. We'll get you out of here on time.
you're just about uh, tell, telling your stories and in the midst of all that, and then we got to go. Um, but what a privilege it is to have brothers that know your story and accept you anyway. Uh, and and uh, uh, what a soft spot you guys can be to other people. Your story matters. You are crucial out there. Uh, you are, and the people you know. Your, your story is, is probably, God's put you where he's put you so that your story and his part in it can make a difference. We live in a wild and woolly world. It's crazy. Uh, you maybe heard the story of the fact that there was a, uh, the, the gate between heaven and hell was broken down. And uh, St. Peter showed up at the gate and saw that it was broken down between heaven and hell. And he said, uh, yelled out to Satan. He said, Satan, the gate's broken down. It's your turn to fix it. Satan says, I'm not going to do it. No way. Ain't going to do it. My people have more things to do than fix gates. And he goes, well, I'm going to take you to court and make sure you get that gate fixed. He said, I'm going to get an attorney and sue you. And he goes, yeah, where are you going to find an attorney? <laughs> it is a rock and roll world. It is a rough world we live in. And then it is difficult. It's difficult to even know who we are in such a world. And, uh, and so the follow-up story that I like is this guy who was an auto dealer walking down the beach. He was facing bankruptcy. And he was walking down the beach depressed over the fact that he was going to lose his auto dealership. He didn't know what to do. He saw a bottle. He kicked it. And out of that uh, bottle comes a proverbial genie who said, thanks for getting me out of this confinement. And because of that, I'm going to give you one free wish. What is it? And he goes, he's thinking about the depressing thought of losing his business. He says, I want to be the only foreign car dealer in a major metropolitan market. Poof, done. He wakes up and he's in this office. He sees his secretary and he says, he says, quick, tell me who I am. And she said, you're the only Cadillac dealer in downtown Tokyo. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Tell me who I am. In the gospel, we are told who we are. We are deeply beloved sons, redeemed of the most high God. And that's made all the difference. Know your story. Tell your story. Make Jesus the hero of your story. Listen to other people. Because you know who you are. You're not perfect, but you know who you are. Most people don't know who they are. Listen to their story and then tell yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we're your boys. Thank you that as we go out into a rock and roll world that's very difficult, a lot of conflict, that we go out knowing who we are. Not perfect, but yours, forgiven and deeply loved. And Lord, I pray that you would give us that grace-based confidence that will enable us to listen, to want to actually know uh, other people's story as we can find the time to meet with them and listen. And Lord, be with my brothers and just may they pour it out knowing that they got nothing to lose. And uh, Lord, use us as disciples to make disciples in a normal way. And we thank you that we get to follow you as we pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. All right, guys, have a great rest of the week.